Welcome to Regional Eats Season 4 Marathon. We spent the season connecting to culinary traditions at our doorstep, like black and white cookies in New York City, or cacciocavallo cheese in southern Italy. We hope you enjoyed this marathon. We'll, we'll be, be back, back soon with Season 5. We're in Loco Rotondo, Italy, and today we're going to see how ricotta is made. Ricotta is a very versatile cheese, we all know it, that can be eaten in very different ways. And technically speaking, it's not even really a cheese because it comes from the liquid way when the milk is curdled. So today we're going to visit a small dairy here in the countryside to find out more about how it's made. Let's go. Ricotta is part of a family of fresh cheeses that are normally eaten the same day. Fresh dairy products are very popular in southern Italy, where each region will make its own version of ricotta depending on the milk used and its flavor profiles. Puglia, the region we're in today, favors a soft, delicate ricotta made with liquid whey derived from cow's milk. Bigger dairies that make cheese often consider liquid whey just a leftover product and use it to feed livestock or even discard it. But for smaller, local dairies here in Italy, it is a great opportunity to optimize their resources and get something great out of them. Just like its sisters, mozzarella and burrata, ricotta is a game of time and chemistry. La ricotta in realtà non è un formaggio né un prodotto del latte. È un sottoprodotto, nel senso che prima si lavora il latte, si recupera il siro e si recupera la ricotta. Quindi diciamo che per produrre la ricotta, cioè non si potrebbe mai produrre solamente la ricotta perché sarebbe uno spreco alla fine di cagliata, cioè per un caseificio. Sì, diciamo che la ricotta è un prodotto fondamentale per l'economia, nel senso la recuperi così da, da, dagli scarti, quindi per l'economia di un'azienda un è molto importante. Today Giovanni is going to show us how he makes ricotta from 100 liters of milk. Out of this 100 liters, only 10 will turn into curds that will then make cheese. But cheese is not the star of the show for us today. In reality, as much as 90% of what's in here is liquid whey, and that's all going to be turning into ricotta. Quindi noi oggi andremo a fare una cacciotta morbida, molto umida, che tende a trattenere molta umidità, quindi recupereremo circa un 10-11%. Il resto sarà tutto il siero che andremo a recuperare per la ricotta. Ok. Quindi un sottoprodotto che recupereremo per, per la ricotta. Abbiamo portato il latte a 40 gradi, quindi un latte crudo, riscaldato, appena munto stamattina. Gli andremo solo ad aggiungere del, del caglio, nient'altro. Questo sarebbe il caglio? Questo è il caglio, sì. Caglio. caglio animale, di vitello. E quindi con l'aggiunta di questo caglio tu... Uh... Passeremo il latte dalla, parte, dalla fase liquida alla fase solida. Okay. E il caglio praticamente serve a questo. Di aspetteremo un 10 minuti, ah, okay. un quarto d'ora circa. Quindi è molto veloce. È un è... passaggio abbastanza veloce, sì. È, è una tempistica, diciamo. È una tempistica che varia, varia in base al tipo di formaggio, esatto. In base al tipo di caglio o in base alle dosi da, da usare anche. Una volta cagliato il latte, nel senso che ha fatto presa, è diventato gelatinoso, non solido. Sì, sì. Andremo a fare la rottura del coagulo con il classico attrezzo, si chiama lo spino. Andremo a separare la parte solida, che rimarrà, dalla parte liquida, che sarà il siro. In base al tipo di grano che poi andremo a lasciare, dipenderà il tipo di formaggio. E anche il tipo di attrezzo? Il tipo di attrezzo, sì, diciamo che possiamo usare questo, ce ne sono altri, per altre tipologie di formaggio. Però diciamo che questo è quello che va per, per la maggiore. Con sì. questo se ne possono fare la maggior parte. Sì, questo l'ho visto, anche in dimensioni più grandi. <ride> Parecchio più grandi. Sì. Appena si inizia a rompere, comunque il coagulo rimane morbido, quindi bisogna essere delicati, non bisogna romperlo tanto, più di tanto, con i suoi tempi, e aspettare che comunque prenda una, la consistenza che vogliamo, quindi ave, dargli sempre il tempo che, che ha il tipo di formaggio. E che dimensione... Avrà il... Visto che noi andremo a fare una caglia... un formaggio morbido, quindi cioè, come, come fosse una noce. Ah, questa dimensione? Questa dimensione, però dobbiamo sempre aspettare che si andrà ad indurire, in modo da, da non perdere troppo, troppo, troppo siro. Quindi più è piccolo, più siro perde, okay, sì. più sarà asciutto il formaggio alla fine. Va bene. E per, per quanto tempo lo romperai? Il tempo dipende sempre da... da, da, da eh. 
No, più, più che dalla dimensione, da, da, dalla durezza che prende il chicco. Quindi diciamo che entra in gioco anche il fattore del, del latte. Quindi più sono alte le proteine all'interno del latte, più sarà duro e quindi sarà diverso il, il movimento. When the curds have reached the desired texture and size, Giovanni will extract them and place them into molds, which will go on to age and become cheese. Finally free from its curdled twin, the liquid whey is ready to be turned into ricotta. Una volta recuperato, lo aggiungiamo semplicemente di sale. È una vera una soluzione di acqua e sale. Lo porteremo a 60 gradi per aggiungere del latte, quindi comunque una, una piccola parte di latte c'è. E lo riporteremo fino a 85 gradi per permettere l'affioramento della ricotta. Quindi la ricotta praticamente sarà, cosa sarà? La cagliata di quel latte che aggiungerai? Cioè come si fa a formare questa ricotta, ricotta cremosa? La ricotta è un passaggio più delicato forse, praticamente l'affioramento del grasso che si lega con le siroproteine. Okay. Le siroproteine che non sono influenzate nel formaggio dal caglio vengono recuperate nella ricotta. Sì. Quindi sono sempre proteine del latte che si legano al grasso che andremo ad aggiungere del latte a una temperatura di 85 gradi con una piccola quantità di, di acido, noi ci andremo ad aggiungere del siero innesto, tende a far affiorare queste, questa unione che si crea tra siero proteine e grasso. Ah, va bene. Che salirà, di... esatto, salirà tutta, affiorerà. Affiorerà. Esatto. affiorerà. È, il termine, è il termine giusto. Giovanni then starts heating up the whey to add milk and ferments to it. If we had to judge a step by how loud it is, I'd say this is definitely a crucial one. Thankfully for our ears, it was also a pretty quick one. Ma questa che si è formata qui in superficie, panna? È solo schiuma. La, la schiuma de, del cappuccino, cioè per intenderci. E noi infatti, cioè questa macchina fa esattamente lo stesso rumore di una macchinetta del caffè. Sembra di entrare in un bar praticamente. Eh, magari. E in quanto tempo raggiunge la temperatura 85 gradi? È già arrivato. Ah, è già arrivato. Quindi molto rapido. While Giovanni carefully removes all the excess foam, we can see it slowly starting to surface. The ricotta we came for today. Una volta fiorata si può solamente raccogliere. Ok. Ah, la raccogli direttamente così? Cercando di, di romperla il meno possibile, in modo da fare in modo che trattiene quanto più, più umidità possibile. Quindi... Così viene bella morbida il risultato finale. E comunque deve essere un movimento abbastanza veloce, perché vedo che comunque un po', un po di, di siero cola, cioè non riesce a trattenerlo tutto. Il siero comunque un po' lo perderà, è, è normale. Però se più si rompe il, il coagulo, diciamo, quello che si è creato, più il siero tenderà a perdere. Però comunque la ricotta dopo un po' tenderà a scendere giù. Una volta scesa giù non, è, no, non si può più raccogliere. Ma in questo mestiere eh, ci sono tante cose dove bisogna prendere l'attimo giusto. Partire da, dal formaggio, l'acidificazione, la, la filatura della mozzarella o... Un sacco di cose si possono fare solo in un determinato momento. Passato quel momento non sono più recuperabili. È sempre stato un casaro. Sì, cerco di, di, di approfondire sempre di più, ma sempre nello stesso settore, cioè non mi sono mai mosso da questo. E come hai com imparato? Eh, diciamo che ho iniziato come il lavoretto di, di, fine, di fine scuola, d'estate, ho iniziato così a lavoricchiare. Poi ho iniziato la passione, quindi non, non mi sono più allontanato. Diciamo che la tradizione ti, ti insegna. Cheese curds, can you name a more quintessential food in Wisconsin? Wisconsin cheese curds have a signature orange color. They have a unique flavor that can vary depending on the batch. And most importantly, when you bite into them, they must, must squeak, which tells you the curd is a good one. We're here in Door County, and we're about to meet Chris Rennard, a third generation artisanal cheesemaker who's been making cheese his entire life. They're going to show us how milk turns into the savory, squeaky snack. The process itself takes four hours. 
It starts with cheesemakers releasing 20,000 pounds of pasteurized whole milk into a large open vat. All the milk that comes in today, we'll make in the cheese tomorrow. For every 10 pounds of milk, you get about one pound of cheese on average. Luckily, Wisconsin is the perfect place to get all this milk locally. The state has about 1.3 million cows, and with that much dairy available, they take cheese production seriously. It's the only state in the United States that requires a special license to sell any cheese of any kind, including curds. Chris gets his milk from 24 family farms in the area that work together with the dairy plant as a cheese-making ecosystem. Depending on the milk that comes in that day, the temperature outside, what the cows have eaten at the time of the year. Every vat of cheese will have a slightly different flavor. All that pasteurized milk gets mixed with just a little annatto seed coloring to give it that orange hue. Wisconsinites prefer their curds orange, while cheesemakers on the East Coast stick to white cheddar. For a vat that holds 20,000 pounds of milk, Renard's adds only 29 ounces of coloring. The seed comes from either South Africa or South America. It does not affect the flavor. What does affect the flavor is the rennet. Unlike cheesemakers in Europe, Chris doesn't use animal rennet to make his cheese curds, which together with the starter cultures, breaks down the milk into cheese. The rennet we use is a microbial rennet. We found it works the best with the cheese. That rennet does a really nice job of setting it up. Yeah. And the enzymes of the rennet help with the aging process. And so we see over here, just observing in the room, it's getting really steamy. We cook everything with a bath with steam, so no matter what time of the year it is, it's always warm in the cheese factory. Cooking it for a couple reasons. One, it's going to help firm that cheese up. It takes some of the moisture out, but it also, you want the starter to be at the optimal temperature. So what are, temperature range do you want to be in for this? We're going to cook this to 100 degrees. Okay. What happens when the cheese mixture gets to 100 degrees? We will shut off the steam so it, it doesn't get any hotter. But what we'll also do is that we keep agitating. The reason is, is we want to firm this curd up. We want the nice, squeaky cheese curd you're going to get. If your starter, if your starter cultures don't get to the right temperature, you'll have an off flavor. So once the cheese firms up, the milk coagulates and it gets nice and firm. Then we'll take wire knives and we run that through, and that is cutting it into curds and whey. Those wire knives are called cheese harps, and they've been around since the 1960s. Once the cheese is cut, it takes about two and a half hours until you see actual curds start to form. Cheesemakers here aim for a nice, even cut. The more even the cut, the more the whey is expelled and the cheese sticks together. We're stirring it right now to keep it from clumping. One of the reasons we do what we do hands-on is we can watch and control all that. We don't have to worry about a malfunction of equipment. We're literally doing it. What we're doing right now is checking to make sure the cheese curds are firm. We want the right firmness to move on to the next process. If you leave it too soft, the proteins, calcium, some of that's going to expel out in your way. As soon as cheesemakers like Chris approve the texture and pH level, whey is removed from the vat and pumped into a cream separator. The cream is sold to Pine River Dairy to make butter, while the whey is sold off to make whey proteins. Once a majority of the whey is drained, Cheesemakers draw the curd to the sides of the vat and let the whey continue to drain down the center. This process is called ditching. We're pushing the cheese to the sides and we're firming it, pushing it together so it's one solid piece. Am I doing this right? You're doing it good. You just push right there, you go. Like that? Yep. Or too much? Yeah, you're okay. And then one more? Yep. Just push it just so it firms up. There you go. Oh, so you don't have to push that hard. Big mass of cheese okay. is going to get trimmed into slabs. And those oh. slabs will be about 20 pounds. Okay. And so what are you doing now? You're cutting the... We're going to level it off. Okay. And then we're going to break up all this cheese on top so it all gets matted into one oh, slab. Oh, I see. What do we do? I just do this? Just, you can break it oh up. Oh my yep. god. So we're breaking it up so that it can layer on top. So it's going to knit all back in together as we roll it over and stack it up. Ugh. This is a good hand massage. Right now, this moisture you're feeling in here yeah. is probably in the 43 to 45 range. Mm. So it's a higher moisture percentage. We Hold don't want it too firm too hard. And why? Because you want to keep the squeak, the moisture in it. Okay. The rubbery texture. Hopefully I'm helping. <laughs> you are. And what are you doing now? So you're showing. What we're doing is we're gonna take all the, the fines 
the smaller curds. Yeah. And we want to mill it in so we get as much of our yield as possible. So Pick grab up the it. Front, slide your hand down the cut side. This way? Yep. And, and turn it right over. And then you got to slide it nice and tight. We want to mat and knit all the feet together in one solid slab. Oh, gravity will Push mold it, it basically. Mold it together, yep. Now we're going to flip it one more time and then we are going to cut it and stack it. Like, okay. I'll let you get the first one and I'll get the rest. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> Afterward, Chris checks the acidity level of the cheese, and if it is in the correct range, they will begin to mill it up into cheese curds. Okay. And what if it doesn't get your desired pH level? We'll leave it set. That's one of the things about being a small artisan plant. We can leave the cheese set if it's not where we want it. We don't have to force it through. The cheese is washed with warm water to expel any extra whey, then salted three times. This is done to seal in and enhance the flavor and also control the pH of the cheese. We're breaking up all the clumps just so we get the salt to distribute evenly. The salt's absorbing into all, all the small pores in the piece of cheese. So, is this the final product? This would be cheese curds. What's the difference between a cheddar curd flavor and a plain curd flavor? One of the differences you'll notice is like a young cheddar compared to a young Colby. In the first seven to ten days, you're not going to taste much difference at all in flavor. Mm -hmm. But after that ten to fourteen day range, when the cultures start really getting a foothold in the cheese, the flavors will start to differ fastly. My cheese makers probably try one turn out of every batch they make. Oh my gosh, can we try? Yes, we Are can. we allowed? Wow. I love the texture of your cheese curds. Thank you. That's wonderful. In total, a plant like Renard's can sell about 1,500 to 2,000 pounds of cheese curds a day. Some of the curds are sent to be breaded at restaurants to fry, while others are packaged and sold fresh at stores. Chris wouldn't let me return to Chicago without trying Renard's myriad of curd flavors. So we're going to try the different flavors of cheese curds that Renard's has for us. All of these cheese curds are their cheddar cheese curds, but they have different seasonings on top. All right, let's give it a go. Mmm, can you hear the squeaky? I don't know if you're gonna hear it. This is so squeaky, it feels so fresh, and it has a little hint of ranch. As you can tell, it's the ranch flavor. It's a little bit moist, but it's also in between a soft mozzarella and a hard aged cheddar. It's basically smack dab in the middle where you get the softness of it, but it's also, it has a little bit of a bite, not too much. But it's super tasty and you can tell that this was salted and then the seasoning on top is really what I prefer. I could pop these in like popcorn. I have to come back to Door County to try out these curds. I'm doing it. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. And our pants are still white. I know. With white pants. Look at that. You can be fashionable and milk a cow. You got it. We are in Ruvo di Puglia, Italy, and today I'm going to meet with Vincenzo and Giuliana, who make some of the most exquisite gelato in the country. Their story is as rich as the one of their hometown. Ruvo, that is renowned for its architecture and rich craftsmanship. For the two siblings, it's all about keeping the craft of gelato making alive. And the best way to do that is to take your family recipe from 1840 and never changing it. Let's go find out more. This is a story of how one family took gelato to a small southern Italian town 180 years ago and gave it a home. The family recipe calls for only three ingredients. Latte, zucchero, uova. Anche se poi ogni gusto ha uh, una componente di ingredienti diversi. C'è dove ci vanno più uova o meno uova, più zucchero o meno zucchero, in base sempre allo stesso quantitativo di latte. Gelato al mocambo has been made this way since well, since 1840. It's all thanks to Uncle Luigi, who brought the art of gelato making from the royal courts of Naples to his hometown, Ruvo, which has been synonymous with gelato ever since. E oggi ti farò in realtà anche un po' lavorare. Va bene, dai, mi devo, <laughs> devo rimboccare le mani. Ok, ma che cosa devo fare? Devo girare? Devi mescolare devo perfettamente mescolare. insieme lo zucchero. Adesso è facile, te lo sì. dico. 
Ok, aggiungiamo altro zucchero. Che dici? Mm -hmm. qua. Troppo a Claudia, si stacca il braccio. Cioè, no, ma oh, non ero preparata. The original 1840 recipe, which is called the King's Cream, has been joined by seven other flavors. Pistachio, almond, chocolate, kins, nougat, janduja and hazelnut. All ingredients are seasonal and that is why your go-to winter flavor here will never be, say, strawberry, but almond. This flavor in particular is made with a homemade almond butter which is actually grinding before our eyes as we speak. Questa è una mandorla eh, locale, quindi siamo a Ruvo, siamo in Puglia, terra di, di olio, di vino e soprattutto di mandorle. Eh, questa in realtà è una delle migliori varietà, una genco, abbastanza molto profumata. Eh, si sente? Eh, quello in particolare è una lavorazione che noi abbiamo cominciato eh, ieri mattina, quindi sono passate all'incirca 24 ore e per essere al punto ottimale ne dovrebbero passare all'incirca 45 di, wow. di lavorazione. Noi adesso diciamo, lo faremo con una pasta un po' più ruvida, infatti dopo il gelato che andremo a degustare avrà una caratteristica un po' più come dire, tradizionale con questa, con questa ruvidità marcata, eh, però è anche il bello diciamo, di, di vedere le varie granulometrie della, della lavorazione. Poi... Si, si vedono un po' i granuli di, delle mandorle. Assaggia, dimmi tu! Vai! Adoro, buonissimo. Questo è un prodotto 100% naturale, proprio stai mangiando una premuta di mandorle. Sì, sì, si, si, si sentono i granuli, ma non tantissimo. Questa macina ti ipnotizza. Riprendi il lavoro. <ride> We're now finally adding the third and final ingredient, milk. Adesso ammorbidiamo un po' l'impatto. Quindi per ogni gusto devi ogni gusto, lavorarlo. Il suo pentolone. Eh, la ricetta della crema da repo in particolare ha un buco di aromi e spezie segreto. Ce lo passiamo in famiglia da 120 anni. Quindi insomma, eh, questo è anche uno dei motivi per cui non ho Oggi potuto... Non, non stiamo facendo quel gusto. Non stiamo facendo quel gusto, <ride> però stiamo facendo qualcosa di eh, tipicamente locale, quindi appunto utilizzando sì. una mandorla, una mandorla non strana. But we are not finished yet. First we need to cook it. And if you think that you could just skip this step, please keep watching. Giuliana feels pretty strongly about it. Perché è importante la cottura? Allora, tu sei italiana. <ride> è, è come dire, apri la bottiglia di passata di pomodoro e mettila direttamente con condicici la pasta. Diciamo che la, la perdita dell'acqua favorisce una maggiore amalgama di sapori. Non puoi fare ricette dove prendi, misco, mescoli tutto e metti, metti nel congelatore. Non ha senso. E quanto tempo rimarrà qui in cottura? Eh, vabbè, il tempo necessario all'incirca andranno via quei 10 minuti. It's now time to pour our cooked mixture in the gelato machine, which will freeze the cream and transform it into gelato. Ma io ho sempre visto queste macchine per fare il gelato che sono orizzontali, non verticali. Cioè, sì. cosa ha di, di speciale questa macchina qui? Allora, in realtà l'hai detto tu stessa. Il cestello di raffreddamento è posto in maniera verticale. Questa in realtà è una macchina eh, con un sistema antico. Questa in particolare ha circa quasi 50 anni e ce la teniamo abbastanza cara. Eh, è un brevetto del 29 e in realtà è rimasta solamente un'azienda a farle così al mondo. Cioè al mondo, oddio, in Italia soprattutto che è la principale. Questa azienda qui invece non le produce più. Comunque tieni conto che questo tipo di miscela Funziona solamente in questa tipologia di macchina. Se vado a metterla in un mantecatore orizzontale ha un effetto differente, non monta come dovrebbe. Quindi sostanzialmente questo è il, il miglior sistema, che poi va a simulare quello che prima questo lavoro veniva fatto a mano. Quindi macchina antica per un gelato antico. You may have been watching this for only a few minutes, but it actually took us five hours to make only one flavor. And while I feel for Giuliana having to do this eight times every day for each flavor, I can't wait to taste the one I worked for today. So let's get to it. Will I be transported to 1840 with this gelato? Adesso ti faccio assaggiare mm. quello per cui hai lavorato quest'oggi. Sì, ma anche l'aspetto comunque, ha ah, l'aspetto di, di una crema. Sembra più uniforme. Buono. Claudia, lo sai che potrei assumerti? Promossa, ti assunta. <ride> Mm. No, buono. Mi ricorda 
insomma adesso non ricordo un po' romantico, però mi ricorda quando io e mio fratello in campagna andavamo a schiacciare le mandorle no, <ride> con le pietre. Qua. You know what I just said about making one flavor taking five hours? Well, this tasting part was no joke either. Giuliana and Vincenzo are very serious about letting me taste every single flavor. Giuliana keeps scooping some more gelato for me. And a special mention goes to... This is pistacchio. Assaggialo. This is good. Che cos'è? Sa, non sa di gelato di pistacchio, sa di crema di pistacchio. I really thought we ended with a bang with pistachio, which I loved, but I may have a new favorite after all, the King's Scepter. This one takes three days to make and is made from Iranian saffron. Giuliana serves it in a cone filled with cream and pistachio paste. She then covers the gelato with some more cream and gold leaves. Non credo che di aver mai mangiato un gelato con questo sapore. No, veramente è buono. Complimenti, questo non l'ho fatto io. Io. <ride> Scusate, no? No, no, tra l'altro. Si sta sciogliendo fare. tutto. We're here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, home to the world's largest concentration of frozen custard shops. Now, frozen custard is not the same thing as ice cream, and by law, it has to have at least 10% butter fat and a lot more egg yolk. And because Wisconsin is home to dairy, lots of dairy, it is the perfect fit for frozen custard shops. Now, what are we waiting for? Let's go see how frozen custard is made. Custard's more dense. Ice cream is a lot of air in it. This, does, this has less amount of air. So when you're eating it, custard goes on your palate and it's gonna stay there longer. Where ice cream, it's gonna melt quicker. But before you even taste that rich frozen custard, it starts as this liquid dairy mix. Cops's mix is top secret, but we do know that it is at least 10% butterfat and more than 1.4% egg yolk. And these aren't just arbitrary measurements. To officially be considered frozen custard, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration actually mandates these percentages. While your premium ice creams may have that same amount of butterfat, your average ice cream probably isn't going to. And it's even more unlikely for ice cream to have that much egg yolk, instead consisting of more air, like Scott said. Cops gets its secret mix from Galloway, a dairy processor that actually introduced frozen custard to the Midwest during the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. The dessert found a home in Wisconsin. Its more than 100,000 dairy farms meant easy access to fresh cream and butterfat milk. We pour it up in the hopper, and then they'll start the machine up. It, these machines are running at about 16 degrees. Ice cream, with our temperatures obviously you gotta be under 32, but not much under 32. So custard is running at a colder temperature. This machine is what really does the work of turning the mix into custard. As the machine freezes the custard, it adds in as little air as possible. While regular soft serve ice cream might be about 40% air, frozen custard can range anywhere from 15 to 30% air, giving it a thicker texture than ice cream. As it thickens, the machine slowly pushes the custard forward. Once the custard gets to the right consistency, it pushes its way through the front of the machine. How old are they? These two machines were made probably in the mid to late 40s. Okay. COPS has a pretty unique way of keeping such old machines running. If something goes wrong, they actually call up Leon's, a competing frozen custard stand that also works on maintaining old custard machines. Because he also has a business, a machine shop, he builds all the parts for us, mm. for all the custard stands. So if we need something, we call them, and they make parts that we need for our machines to keep them going. 138. Is it plain, or is it vanilla? We, we call it a plain. Most people would say it's vanilla. It's, vanilla is a plain. Until we add the vanilla extract, 
to us it's not a vanilla custard. That vanilla extract is what makes it the vanilla custard. Right now we're probably spending close to $500 a gallon. Oh wow. Uh, it's the premier vanilla extract. It's like uh, comparing it to a Volkswagen to a Mercedes. We're using that Mercedes. You can taste that expensive vanilla in this custard. This vanilla tastes so good. It has a very creamy consistency. There's, there's so much more of the treat in one bite, or one lick, I should say. This is definitely better than ice cream. Beer isn't what made Milwaukee, it's the custard. We're in San Nicandro Garganico, Italy, and today we're going to see how Cacciocavallo cheese is made. Cacciocavallo is one of the most popular cheeses here in southern Italy, and it's famous for its elongated shape. What we're going to see today is a special kind of Cacciocavallo, the Podolico kind, which is made with the raw milk of Podolica cattle, a rare breed of cattle that is able to survive in the harshest conditions that we can find here. These conditions make their cheese one of the most expensive in Italy, sometimes even more expensive than the finest of Parmesans. Let's go find out more. The Podolica cows that make this seaside cheese scatter all over as they roam, making it hard to tell that you're actually on a farm. Meet Virginio, one of only a handful of producers making the cheese we are here to learn about. He uses a recipe that his grandparents taught him, though the most important element of this recipe is location. Here in San Nicandro Garganico, we are only one kilometer from the sea and 100 meters above sea level. This is an important detail, and we'll soon know why. E qui ci troviamo quasi vicino al mare, vicino a due laghi di acqua salata, insomma famosi qui. Qua ci troviamo um, tra il lago di Lesina e Barano. Ed influisce un po' la presenza di questi laghi? Sì, influisce perché tu hai la... praticamente tutti i microelementi li troviamo nel, nel microambiente, calcio, eh, iodio, eh, magnesio, abbiamo tutto a disposizione quindi non abbiamo bisogno di integrazioni alimentari. The Podolica produce only 3 to 6 liters of milk a day, which is much less than the 30 liters an average cow might produce. Today we're working with 50 liters. The environment in which the cows feed gives this milk a rich, earthy flavor. The whole cheese making process takes 5 hours. Virginio heats up the milk to 40 degrees and have to warm it up but still keep it raw, which is essential to make this type of cacciocavallo. If the milk were to become too warm, it would scorch and kill off the unique flavor that the Podolica cow's milk brings to the special cheese. He then adds rennet and fermented whey from yesterday's production. And after 20 minutes, he starts cutting the curd. He aims for the size of a grain of rice. To do that, he uses this mushroom-looking tool which is called menaturo, a word that, as you might have guessed, comes from the local dialect. Ma come mai ha questa forma a fungo? In pratica perché ha già la rottura della cagliata. Ah, ok. Però tutti gli altri strumenti che ho visto per tagliare altri formaggi hanno tipo delle reti, insomma. Sì, sono anche delle attrezzature. Ah, ok. <ride> Quindi questo anziché, diciamo, essere a rete, a gratta, è più ah, uniforme. Guarda, sì, sì, è un pezzo di olivastro all'esterno e più un bastone di qualsiasi. Quindi questo è lo strumento sì. tradizionale sì, sì, per il cacio cavallo. Rather than slowly cutting the curd, to make cacciocavallo, Virginio energetically slashes through it. This breaks it up into the small pieces he's hoping to achieve. We are used to seeing curd being extracted and then shipped into cheese right away. But here, it actually rests further with some of its own warm whey, to allow for more concentrated flavor to develop. Keeping the curd nice and warm will facilitate its fermentation. While some other cheesemakers might use a steel vat for this process, here Virginio uses a maple vat to ferment the cheese. This also impacts the flavor and the notes of acidity that tickle your tongue as you eat. Virginio tells us this takes about one hour, but because it's winter, we ended up waiting for three hours instead. The curd is ready to be stretched. Virginio takes out a bit of whey to keep its ferments for tomorrow. He then slices the curd in smaller parts, which will then be kneaded in hot water. In comparison to the stretched curd of mozzarella, this one will be harder. This is due to the waiting time as well as the size of the curd when it was cut. Ma anche il sapore sarebbe diverso, perché quando la pasta è dura, tu hai un formaggio stagionato più morbido. Quando la pasta è morbida, hai un formaggio stagionato più duro. 
E quindi c'è più sapore nel formaggio perché è più concentrato. In quello umido, sì. In quello eh, umido sì. sì, perché riesce a conservare sapore. Invece nel formaggio, un formaggio più morbido come la mozzarella viene perso un po' nel latte, sì. nell'acqua, sì. sì. Anche un colore più giallino Giallo. rispetto alla pasta che è l'alimentazione usa... degli animali. Ah, quindi non dipende, da, non dipende da quanto tempo è stata qui, no, ma è proprio no, il no, colore del latte. Questo è solo il colore del latte, sì, sì. Quindi il latte Qua in pratica è... tutti i beta caroteni, tutti i principi nutritivi del pascolo verde li ritroviamo tutti quanti. Quindi diciamo come regola base, se il latte è un po' più giallo vuol dire che ci sono più nutrienti. Vai, sì. più ricca di vitamine. Sì, quindi l'immagine che abbiamo del latte bello bianco, sì, sì. in verità non è... Scremato, eh, strascremato, sì. c'è cioè, la fine del latte, ci cioè, rimane poco e niente. Sì. E comunque c'è un'omogenizzazione un dei sapori. In pratica quando ero bambino avevo un'intolleranza al latte. Eh. Ah, davvero? <ride> eh, proprio a te che fai, sì. che fai i formaggi? E allora praticamente dopo mille prove mio padre ha deciso di darmi il latte vaccino. Quindi è da otto giorni che, che bevo latte di podolica. Ah, da otto giorni di vita praticamente. Ah, il, tu quindi bevi il latte crudo? Il latte crudo che abbiamo utilizzato sì. qualche sì. ora fa per fare questo. Sì, questo è il latte che consumo io. Ah. Forse per questo sono così legata a loro. Eh sì, <ride> insomma ti ha salvato la vita perché <ride> letteralmente. Virginio then adds some malt water to the curd. He will shape it into two cheeses, each weighing 2.5 kilos. This process will be done completely by hand, so let's get comfortable. <laughs> He tells me this water is 100 degrees, yes, Celsius, and judging by the color of his hands and smoke around us, I don't envy him. Questa belli calli qua, sembra di stare tutti attorno a un camino. Oh, è lunghissima, guarda. C'è un serpentone praticamente. Perché le due teste hanno una dimensione diversa? Eh, perché comunque la testa è la parte più salata, quindi in realtà non si mangia. No, quella è la parte più buona. Vabbè, dei gusti, però... La parte più buona è il cuore. No, io sono una grande fan delle, delle teste dove c'è la buccia. No. Sono buone. Each cheese goes through different shapes before reaching its final one. Virginio has his personal signature shape, too. When Virginia is happy with the shape of the cacciacavallo, he places it in cold water to set the shape and stop the fermentation. He then adds a rope around the cheese's heads to tie the pair together. La caratteristica è che vanno in due. Sì, la comunità del cacciacavallo è che tu lo lasci assaggionare senza doverlo girare e rigirare. Perché se ah tu beh, hai sì. un formaggio su un piano, tu ogni tanto sei costretto a girarlo per, lasciare, per far asciugare tutte e due le facce omogeneamente. E perché poi il peso di uno Regge il peso dell'altro. Certo, eh, sono due gemelli. <laughs> sì. Once paired, the two cheeses move to bathe in brine. The time they spend here depends on weight. Every kilo needs 24 hours. These two new entries weigh 2.5 kilos, so they stay here for 60 hours. And when that time is over, their next destination is something unexpected. Perché siamo fuori? Eh, questa è la mia prassi personale, io lo lascio per due ore qua ad asciugare sotto il mio ah. albero porta fortuna. Sotto gli alberi di Così il vento lo asciuga anche un po' esternamente <ride> e poi rimane tutta bello, bello giallo. È un gesto scaramantico. <ride> sì, beh giustamente le mucche mangiano, respirano l'aria di... Eh, anche il cacciacavallo anche... fa lo stesso. <ride> e anche i cacciacavalli. Ecco perché sono poi appesi eh Sì, sono a coppia. cavallo del sì. gancio. Ah, ecco, ecco. Quindi abbiamo spiegato anche il significato. A cavallo means over the hook, hence the name of the cheese. The tree is actually the only time the cheeses will see some sunlight, as the pair will spend the rest of their aging days in caves. The minimum aging is six weeks, and the maximum two years. Today, Virginia has prepared a six-month-old cacciacavallo for us to taste. A cheese this old is worth $40 a kilo, which translates into just over $100 a piece. Ovviamente noi abbiamo la, la buccia quella esterna che va, che va buttata via. Noi ci rendiamo conto che il cacciacavallo è stagionato quando questo inizia a diventare dorata. Ah sì, sì, si vede. Sì. La buccia è molto, mo, molto spessa e all'interno praticamente molto sì, granulosa. La, 
la buccia praticamente um, funziona come un contenitore uh, per il casciolo, per il formaggio vero e proprio. È un po' come un formaggio, sì. un parmigiano, non so, un grano, un formaggio granuloso, grazie. Wow. Mm. E si sentono de degli aromi. È un po' salato in effetti, ma è la, la salamoia o proprio no, mh, è, la... è proprio lo iodio e l'aria l'aria di della terra. Si sente, Come si sente. Il peccato non è il sale da cucina. Sì, sì, è il sale da. cioè sale marino, insomma. Sì. Di solito sono un po' più morbidi, un po' più dolci. C'è anche un po', un po' piccante, no? Sì. Questo è anche l'effetto del, dell'aria salata praticamente, dell'uovo. L'aria in cui viviamo, sì. Che stiamo. Buono, buono. <ride> e quindi normalmente si mangia così, c'è cioè neanche con un pezzo di pane, proprio. Con un po' di pane da solo. L'alimento è praticamente il formaggio che chiude, la... che chiude il pranzo. We're here in Wisconsin, the birthplace of Colby cheese. It's one of the fastest growing varieties in the United States. We're headed to Springside Cheese, one of the longest running factories in Northeast Wisconsin and a family operation. Like most cheeses, Colby starts with a giant vat of milk, a starter culture in rennet. But after that, things get a bit more unique. What happens is, is when you have grass fed cows, the milk is a little bit more yellowish or darker in color. The cows aren't fed a grass diet, which means the milk they create is closer to white than the yellowish color Colby cheese is expected to be. This will turn it orange. Oh, it's okay, from great. an evergreen tree in but South it, America. It makes it orange. Yep, it helps with that. It keeps it that orange color. It's kind of an appeal. Wisconsin is home to 1.3 million dairy cows and has about 25% of the United States dairy farms. The state is the biggest producer of cheese in the U.S. In 2021, two Wisconsin lawmakers introduced a bill to make Colby the state's official cheese. Springside Cheese has been making its Colby here in Wisconsin since 1982. The mild cheese gets its name from the town of Colby, Wisconsin, where Colby cheese was created in the late 1800s. After being stirred, the coagulated mixture is given about 30 minutes to set into the perfect firmness for Colby cheese. Then, it's time to cut it into curds. This is done with harp paddles. While they may just look like paddles with holes, they're actually lined with extremely sharp blades. We, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get it down to the ideal size. Okay. So it can have, uh, again, we're looking for fat retention. We're also looking for moisture. So a little bit better curd will give you a little bit more moisture. After being cut, the curds are given time to form a skin. You're building a skin on the outside of the curd. On the curd, okay. After it's been cut, you, you ripped it apart, now it's taking its time to heal itself back up. You want to get, be able to keep as much moisture as par possible right. in the product, so okay. we give it a lot longer to heal up than what we would normally do in other products. That extra moisture is key to the Colby making process. The more moisture that goes in, the sweeter and less acidic the final cheese will be. As the curds are cut with harps, they are separated from the whey. After about 20 minutes, it's time to once again cook the freshly cut curds. When you first start it out, the curd is very fragile and soft and it pop very easily. And it's actually getting pretty hot now, I can feel it. So we're, we're cooking up to a target temperature. As it stirs up, it's slowly cooking the curd up. So it's almost like searing a steak. You're searing that moisture into the curd. It's shrinking it up and it's stiffening the curd up. It's giving it more body. After we get done cooking it, we'll continue to stir it and it'll get stiffer and stiffer. The curds are stirred and cooked for 20 minutes. Then it's time to check on their firmness. How do you measure, are you literally just gonna scoop up the yeah, curds to see? We'll feel it. Okay. That's the only way to really to do, do it, it is yeah. feel it by hand. When the curds reach the right firmness, they are separated from the whey. Once the whey has been removed, the curds are given about 30 to 45 minutes to settle into the right pH. Then it's time to add cold water to the vat. But there's no set amount of water to add. Instead, Jesse and his team will stop the water when the curds reach a specific temperature. 92.5. Okay. 87.6. That 87.6 is key to the making of Springside's Colby cheese. One, we want to slow the starter down. 
um, so it's not devel developing as fast. We also want to add moisture so the curd will pick up moisture from the cold water. Slowing the acidification is also important, as that is what makes Colby sweeter and milder than other cheeses. When the vat hits the target temperature, the entire contents are drained into a basin. It will be agitated some more to prevent clumping. Once the mix hits a certain pH, it's time to drain the water and whey. It'll all drain down towards the port. As it drains down to the port, we'll pull that, we'll work it back in, and then we'll start to work the cheese with uh, forks. We're just stirring it, we're trying to keep stirring it from it. lumping together. Okay. So the goal is to keep it as granular as possible. Lift it up? Yep, just lift it up. Ugh. <laughs> I have to do it this way. I'm a righty. Ugh. It clumps really easily. Yeah, it I'm... does. But again, that's part of the reason for adding the salt on to try yeah. and prevent that. You all must be so strong. <laughs> all right, so let's feel a curd. Oh, wow. I'm holding back on eating this right now. But it's <laughs> very soft. And you're saying as we press it, it's going to get even softer than this? This will get soft. This is kind of where it's going to be. Yeah, this, but once we texture. press it. But it is a very soft cheese. So normally it'd be a lot stiffer, stouter cheese. Yeah, you can tell it's like easily, it's like moldable. Yep, you see the moisture coming off in your yeah, hand. Yeah, it's very, there's a lot of moisture. I don't know if you can see it. It smells very good. Yeah. It honestly feels nutty. How would you describe the smell? It smells to me, yeah, I guess it, on a nutty side or a, more of a dairy side of it. It'll have a milder flavor, be sweeter. It'll also have a lot of buttery notes in it. So that, okay. Oh, butter, that's what I smell. Yep. It's a lot of butter. Yep. That's so. why I like it. I was like, what is it about this that <laughs> I like? Jesse and his team will keep agitating the curds to remove any excess whey and then begin to salt them. You're salting the curds, and what does that do to the curd mixture? It helps with some clumping. It also stops the bacteria from continuing to develop. It slows down your pH, so it slows down your starter development, so yeah. you're not producing as much acid. Salt also adds flavor. It keeps it on the sweeter side because you're stopping the starter at a higher pH. Once salted, the curds are ready to be pressed into their final 13-pound longhorn form. The longhorn will give the cheese its long cylinder shape. When it's finally packaged, it may be cut in half to resemble a half moon or a rainbow. When it goes in a press, it's going to lose some of the moisture and weight, so we'll weigh it up a little bit heavier. And then once it's all done, it'll be 13 pounds. And then we can see, is that excess weight in water? Yep, so okay. that's pressing out of the cheese right now. So that the only thing that remains are the curds. The curds. For and the a little part. bit of a, yeah. yeah. After being pressed, the curds are removed from the horn, sealed, put back into the horn, and placed in a cooler to age. We want to keep it in the horn to maintain that cylinder shape. How long does Colby cheese need to age for? Ideally, you'd be four weeks to six months okay. is the ideal range for it. Compared to cheddar cheese, what's the difference? Higher pH, higher moisture. And so how long do you have to age cheddar for? Cheddar you can age out 30 plus years. But that, that's wild. That's like Colby is a baby compared to cheddar. So while we wait for the cheese to age, let's check in on the ones who made it all possible, the cows. Springside gets its dairy from farms like Jagiella Farms, where it actually picks up milk every day. According to these local farmers, Wisconsin cows eat the best diet, so they produce the best milk, which makes for the best cheese. The cows are fed a diet that includes high moisture corn in a protein mix. The final feed is called TMR, or total mixed ration. Now we have a nutritionist come in, Yeah. he comes every two weeks, uh -huh. he tests his feed out of the silos to tell you what you need and what they need to add to supplement to get it up to what the cow needs to milk. The cows have to be milked twice a day, producing about 50 pounds of milk each time. The cow is like a factory. Mm -hmm. What you put into the cow is what you get out of the cow. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get quality milk, you're going to quality feed going into a cow. And this delectable looking cheese is one of the things Springside gets out of these cows. Wow. This feels more buttery than cheddar. And it's a little, it's mild. Mm -hmm. It's not that strong. I love mild cheeses. I think mild cheeses are the best. 
How would you describe it? Do you want to eat with me? Sure, I'll <laughs> eat a piece with you. Wow, <laughs> and it's so soft. This is magnificent. And how does it taste fresh versus old? Like, does it get more mild or does it get? Softer, I think. Once mm. it's refrigerated, it firms up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, the flavor with Colby really gets stronger with age. Wow. It was worth the wait. You have to make all your reporters work. <laughs> They're gonna bother you for a day. They should work. They make them work. Yeah. <laughs> like you can, you can film me, but you have to work with me. <laughs> <laughs> you may know it by the name of Capocollo, Coppa, Capicola, Gabagol, dozens of names to describe one Italian delicacy. A distinctive cured meat made from pork neck easy to spot thanks to its vivid red color and beautiful marbling. Unlike ham, the fat in pork neck makes capocollo a soft, tender and incredibly tasty cut. We're in the countryside of Martina Franca, Italy, and today we're going to talk about one of the country's finest capocollo, capocollo di Martina Franca. This type of capocollo is very special because it's made from pigs that feed only on acorns from a local tree, Fragno, and it doesn't stop there. The tree is also very important in the making process. Let's go find out more. Il pezzo di carne che noi in questo momento inizieremo a lavorare viene realizzato dalla testa alla settima vertebra. Dopodiché viene risossato e, e viene lavorato. Ma quindi i maiali hanno due colli? Eh, ah. un maiale ha due colli, un destro e okay. un sinistro. Per un maiale potremmo ricavare solamente due capocolli. Ma non c'è differenza tra il destro e il sinistro? No, è sempre il pezzo anatomico uguale. Ok. L'importante è che viene, lav viene lavorato dalla testa alla settima vertebra. The piece Giuseppe works with is a big one, about 3 or 4 kilos, which at the end of the curing process will lose about 50% of its weight. The meat is then seasoned with salt, pepper and a touch of senise chili pepper, a variety of chili pepper coming from the neighboring region of Basilicata that adds a sweet, smoky scent to the meat. The capocollo then cures for 15 days, and every couple of days it is rubbed by hand to ensure it absorbs all the flavors from the spices. Unlike other types of capocollo that will go straight to dry curing, this one is also brined for six hours. But this brine is not your average water and salt. It's vin cotto, cooked grape must, Grape must is that thick, fresh juice you get when crushing grapes to make wine. Its freshness also makes it high in sugar, a perfect sweetener, but also a drink. Martina Franca nasce come paese vinicoltori, producevano vino. Mm -hmm. E questo vincotto veniva realizzato nel, nel periodo di vendemmia. Quindi adesso si deve fare un bel bagno. Che in questa marinatura, che succede? Se c'è un po' di sale in eccesso, viene scaricato, si scarica. Quindi come il sale prima doveva entrare proprio nel, nel Ora capocollo? Ora deve entrare il vino fatto... a cuore, in modo tale sì. per dare quel sapore che è unico. Dopo messi in marinatura si passa alla fase di insacco. La fase di insacco noi usiamo budello naturale, lo stomaco del maiale, non, artifici non artificiale, lo stomaco del maiale. Che è questo? Che è questo. Quindi è perfetto proprio per insaccare. Sì. Si sente proprio l'odore di vin cocto. Sì, sì. sì. After casing it, Giuseppe pierces the capocollo to allow excess air out, firmly tying a string to it to be able to hang it during the curing. To make sure the capocollo has a perfect cylindrical shape, he first wraps it with a sock and then puts it through a custom-made funnel. Sembra uno di quegli strumenti per misurare la misura della valigia all'aeroporto. Sì, infatti, lo si mette dentro. No. Wow. Ora viene messa una seconda calza che serve sempre per compattare e per dare per stringere per far sì che tutta l'umidità l'acquina che comunque c'è adesso eh, poi Vada via. Sì, quindi adesso viene praticamente stretto tra Esattamente, per far sì che tutto il sangue, tutto il vincotto e quant'altro poi... E rimane solo, solo, solo la carne. Esattamente, solo la carne, esattamente. 
Ed ecco il capocollo. Un bambino. Un bambino. <laughs> the goal now is to remove all the excess liquid from the meat. This drying phase will happen gradually in three different temperature controlled environments. The first one is a drying room, where the meat will spend seven days and lose all of its liquids, like grape must and blood. The second, a pre-curing room, is a room with high humidity levels to reintroduce some moisture into the meat. Lì abbiamo lavorato su 20 gradi e 50 di umidità. Poi invece iniziamo a lavorare al contrario. Abbiamo 17 gradi, cominciamo a scendere come temperatura e aumentare l'umidità. Significa che passiamo sui 68-70 gradi. Stiamo sì. ridando di nuovo umidità, lì è umido, l'umidità. Aria questo... pulita, aria pulita. <ride> Quindi questo, questo mi fa presagire che nella prossima cella ci sarà ancora più umidità sì. e la temperatura sarà più bassa, sì. no? Okay. Ah. After another seven days in the pre-curing room, the meat reaches the final destination of its curing process, the curing room. It will stay here for 150 days. La vera stagionatura perfetta in questo caso. In questo caso il nostro prodotto starà sui 15 gradi e 80, 85 di, 80, 85 di umidità. At the end of the 150 days, it's time to remove the socks to finally reveal the capocollo hiding inside. E perché lo fate, lo fate fuori? Ah, perché la nostra azienda, grazie alla nostra, alle nostre famiglie, abbiamo avuto la fortuna di crearlo proprio nei boschi, nel, proprio nel, nel clima adatto di salumi, significa la, della freschezza delle querce che abbiamo qua nel nostro bosco. Allora, stando nella natura, per me è un valore aggiunto lavorare fuori per avere un prodotto veramente d'eccellenza. Beh, che poi c'è da dire che nonostante siamo fuori si sente un profumo incredibile. Eh, eh. Dopo tutto questo lavoro che, eh, sì, che sì. abbiamo fatto, cioè, sicuramente avremo, eh, avremo dei prodotti eccellenti. Quindi adesso comunque è asciutto, non secco, ma ah, eh, bro, non secco, ha tutta la... ah, tutte le, le, le caratteristiche del capocollo. Ecco, qui ci sono tre canze. Eh sì. Quattro canze. Wow. Ok. Ora in questo momento abbiamo un prodotto già da poter affumicare nello stesso tempo fra qualche giorno essere commercializzato. Quindi questo è il capocollo... È il capocollo di Martina Franga, il famoso capocollo di Martina Franga. Il profumo è davvero inebriante. Mm. Si fa come se si fa, non vediamo l'ora di poterlo assaggiare, <ride> ci sta facendo venire l'acqua lì in bocca. Giuseppe tricked me when he said the capocollo is calling us to taste it. We still have another step to see, the smoking. To better understand just how much this step affects the final product, we need to go back to the forest that is so dear to Giuseppe. While he removes all the socks, his son Andrea tells me more about the local oak tree, Fragno. Oggi ci troviamo qui alla Corte dei Fragni, nonché un grande bosco eh, immerso nella natura. Il fragno è un, un albero molto importante a Martina, eh, proprio perché il capocollo che noi comunque produciamo viene eh, affumicato grazie al fragno che è comunque un, un albero che mh, ci dà la possibilità di dare un profumo eh, molto ma molto buono affumicandolo. Il fragno è importantissimo anche perché i nostri maiali che vivono allo stato brado si cibano di ghiande di fragno, ecco per esempio ecco qui ci abbiamo eh, esattamente. Piri 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 piri. Spreading from the Balkans to Turkey, the Itria Valley is the only place in Italy where you can find this type of oak. The fertile soils of this hilly farmland together with the very Italian practice of curing pork neck, makes Capocollo from Martina Franca a truly unique product. After breathing the crisp air of the Court of Fragni, I rejoined Giuseppe in the smoking room, or the black room, as he likes to call it. Qua dentro bo, accenderemo il fuoco e con il fragno, quelle querce che voi avete visitato che i maiali mangiano le ghiande da terra, quelle sì, querce sì, là, sì. noi prenderemo dei rametti e accenderemo il fuoco e verranno affumicati. Perché questa è un'altra ricetta anche tipica, perché i nostri nonni prima, 50 anni fa, non c'era la possibilità, voglio dire, di mettere i conservanti o quella roba lì. Per non, per non avvicinarsi alle mosche, per non attaccare la mosca, venivano affumicati. 
ancora eh. aggiunge anche comunque un e sapore. E poi aggiunge anche il, il nostro profumo, la, la caratteristica della querce. Dopo la fumicatura si passa ad andare a degustare il famoso capovolo. Ah, andiamo, prima che accendano il fuoco. Sì. Wow, si inizia già a intravedere. Tutti i nostri profumi stanno uscendo, vedi? Sì, incredibile, si sente... Il vincotto, lo, il vincotto riesce a sentire le caratteristiche del vincotto. Sì, sì, anche, anche la, la, fumicatura. la fumicatura. E anche si sente che la carne è, è morbida, cioè non, sì. è, non è secca. Si, si sì. riesce anche a vedere dal sì. colore bel, un bel rosso. Che in questo, in questo pezzo, cioè comunque in questo taglio, non c'è tanto, tanto grasso. Cioè veramente... E il capocollo ha ah, il 15%, perché ha il giusto per mantenerlo umido o la fettina. Ed è proprio una caratteristica del collo. Del collo, sì. sì. Del collo, sì. Lo degustiamo. Ma... Mm. Mm. Buonissimo, si sente il vincotto, anche il pepe, proprio sì. il sale, il pepe, le spezie, però mi piace tantissimo che comunque rimane quel sapore di, di carne. No, 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 perché i maiali sono lo stato bravo, eh, che hanno mangiato le ghiande nel nostro bosco, si sente proprio che è una bella carne, bella soda sì. e ben saporita. Sì, sì. C'è anche un po' un, insomma, questo retrogusto di... E il retrogusto della fumigatura, sì, del vincotto. Veramente, veramente incredibile. Infatti. Buono, buono, buono. Buonissimo. <ride> Quindi per fare questo capocollo quanti giorni ci sono voluti in totale? 160 giorni, 150 giorni. 160 giorni. 150, 160 giorni. Hey, we have a new project that we're really excited to show you. Here's the trailer. So what are you going to show us today? Well, I love wine. This is a Japanese knife. What do you use this for at the restaurant? We use it for, of course, meat, steaks, ducks, roast. It moves and cut and cut and cut. It's indestructible. C'est bon? If you like the look of that, subscribe to Food Insider and tune in tomorrow to watch the full episode. The United States is the biggest producer of popcorn in the world, and the majority comes from right here in the Midwest. The secret to the American popcorn people can't get enough of are these one-of-a-kind kernels, which only grow in the Midwestern region known as the Corn Belt. There's kernel in my boot. <laughs> this type of kernel is what you most likely eat in a movie theater, and this type is better for your caramel and cheese coating. But no matter the type, if you're eating popcorn, there's a high probability it comes from here. We get an inside look at both the making and planting process of the popular Crunchy snack. We visited Preferred Popcorn in Indiana in the spring, when popcorn kernels need to be planted so they can be harvested in the late summer or early fall. The company plants 100 million pounds of popcorn kernels a year. For all those kernels to turn into the best American popcorn, it all starts with the soil. Farmers here say conditions in the Midwest create soil that produces near-perfect kernels. First of all, because of temperature. If you go too far south in the growing conditions, it gets too hot and popcorn does not like a lot of heat. So southern Indiana to northern Indiana and out through Nebraska is some of the best areas to grow corn. It's the, it gets cooler at night, the higher expansion we'll have out of it. In southern Indiana here, we get over 60 inches of rain a year is our normal season. So uh, it, it's Mother Nature takes care of us. This extra rainfall allows the soil to be fertile and rich. The moisture in the soil provides the corn the nutrients it needs to grow. The flat land also makes it easier to plant and harvest crops. When you pick up the soil and, and it crumbles like that between your hands, your fingers, 
that is it's ready to plant. Okay. Versus if it would clump. It, together. it would clump together and clay, then then it won't. The seeds can't germinate through it. So you want it to be mellow like this. Is, is what it's called. It's just it's just perfect to plant today. There they are. Right in there, ready to grow. I'll cover that one back up. We need it. In about seven days, these seeds will germinate, and three days later, they will emerge from the ground. And as they grow, there's a telltale sign to know if what you're looking at is actually popcorn or another type of corn. The only way to tell the difference between popcorn and field corn as you're driving down the road, popcorn tassels hang down like an umbrella, where field corn tassels stay erect. Popcorn is one of six types of corn. It's a variant of flint corn called Zé Maize Verta, or corn turned inside out. It's the only maize that pops. The kernels are generally smaller and harder and can come in about 100 different strains. Farmers breed the popcorn plant to enhance taste, texture, and popability. We have two different types of popcorn. You have butterfly popcorn, which blows apart and makes like a butterfly. And then you have mushroom corn that makes like a ball. The difference is in that we plant different seeds in the ground in order to get that. To look at the kernels themselves, you really can't tell a difference between the butterfly kernels and the mushroom kernels. At the time of the harvest, the corn is picked and fed through a combine, which strips the ear from the stalk and removes the kernels from their cobs. The kernels are then taken to a storage bin. Okay, we're looking at our storage bins. We can hold uh, there's about 25 million pounds of corn here in the big bins is where we're going to go to first. Yeah, let's get in. Is this good? Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> there's kernel in my boot. <laughs> There's kernels in your boots. All right, so where are we right now, Brian? Okay. We're in bin number 110. It okay. holds it holds 3.2 million pounds of popcorn. So what we have a hold of here is a temperature cable oh. that we have cables in the bins because we've talked about how important the moisture is. Mm -hmm. Well, what this does is every three foot, there's a moisture sensor on this. So when the bin is completely full, then it's, it's checking the moisture throughout the bin and it's turning the fan on and off depending on the outside conditions. If, it's, if we need to add a little water when the humidity is high or it's raining a little bit, it'll turn the fans on automatically to keep that moisture content perfect all throughout the whole bin. Between 13 and a half and 14 and a half percent. That's what makes that kernel blow up the, the highest potential. So I'm, I'm touching this kernel right now. Yep. Can you by feel know the no. moisture content? No, I wish we could. The, the way it flows, it is in good, it, it's in perfect condition. If corn is a little wet, it doesn't flow good. Like when we step in this yeah. and the corn slides down, that means it's in good condition. That's it's just nice sign. big kernels of corn. We can keep it for four or five years. Four or five years? Yes. Oh, wow. That's, that's what's good about popcorn. It has that real hard outer layer, a pericarp on it, so that protects it. So as long as we can keep the moisture, and, and check on it, then it'll keep for a long time. You could put field corn in, in an oven and try to heat it up and it will burn and, and just kind of explode a little bit. I tried but, to do that when I was yeah. a kid. <laughs> it will not work, <laughs> but we need to try it. And that's why, because that corn is way too soft. The yes. kernels are too soft for it to actually pop. Yes. That's what fills the bin. Oh, that's what fills the bin. out there and it goes to the top. We're going up a silo, correct? Yes. All the way to the top. Oh my, well, we're on top of a silo with Brian over here. Holy moly, we're going down. Yeah. So we're on top of? We're on top of, there's a, about two million pounds of corn in this bin that we're standing on top of. Oh my God, imagine if we sunk in. <laughs> yes. So. so two million pounds. Two million pounds of popcorn. Holy moly. Oh, so if it, I guess if this popped up, it would be 48 times the size of this bin, popped. So what? Think, think of that. Wow, so imagine 48 of these silos, <laughs> these sandboxes. All right, we're coming back up. I'm gonna try to unload all the... <laughs> <laughs> when the kernels have reached the optimal moisture level, they go through a series of sorting machines where size, shape, color, and cleanliness are taken into consideration, while foreign materials like cobs are eliminated through an air generation system. During this step, 
teeny tiny kernels are separated if, for example, they don't meet popability requirements. These lighter kernels, unfit for human consumption, are separated through a gravity table and transported to a bin for cattle feed. For the lucky kernels, it's time for packaging. The bags are on a conveyor belt here, and it goes down and then it, it slides them down. The corn is in a bin above us. They hold about 6,000 pounds each. And as they fill, they're weighing the exact amount out and then dropping the corn down into the bag. A normal load is 900 bags. 900? Yes, and we try to do 10 loads a day. So we, we process approximately 9,000 bags per day. Here at Preferred Popcorn, kernels are packed, shipped, and sold to high-end clientele, movie theaters, and grocery stores. Brian and his team take out one bag out of every first and fifth pallet, dump it out on a table with bright lights, and check the kernels by hand as a final test. We're looking for anything that would be not popcorn in here, like a weed seed or a, a okay. stick, something that would be introduced from the farmer's field into the, into the combine as he's harvesting. What we're doing is double checking our cleaning equipment, making sure that it was thorough with getting everything out mm -hmm. and having a very nice finished product to be ready to ship. Out of that corn, we take out uh, 250 grams okay. of popcorn. We're going to add a half a cup of coconut oil and put it in an MWVT t tester. And what it is, it is testing what the percentages of expansion is from the weights. Uh, we have to let the temperature get up to 480 degrees. Okay. And that's why this is a special popper. It's different than what you would see in a movie theater because it has the consistent temperature of 480 degrees. Where a, a movie theater popper will heat up and cool down, this will stay consistent. So with the popcorn that we're testing today, yep. how many times more than the kernel should it expand to? Mushroom corns uh, will pop about 30 to 33 times and butterfly corns will pop 42 to 48 times expansion. So, so it means you're gonna get more servings. That popped really good, popped about a 35, 34 to 35, which is really, really good. Looking for is a round ball with no wings on it. This would be a mushroom kernel, but it has wings on it. So we're trying to get just round balls. And then we, we have a farmer that gets this and feeds it to his chickens. Once the test is complete, 2,500 popcorn bags are shrink-wrapped with net and plastic and stacked onto a pallet. Leaving the farm. Preferred Popcorn ships about three and a half loads of its monster mushroom variety to Chicago's Nuts on Clark once a month. They're known for adding classic toppings like cheese and caramel, which are best made with the round-shaped popcorn that comes from the mushroom kernel. The way you get popcorn is there's moisture in each kernel. So when it heats up and it steams, and then it pops. That's how you get popcorn. Most popcorn will pop when the kernel's internal temperature reaches 400 to 460 degrees Fahrenheit. The thicker pericarp, or hull, of the popcorn allows for pressure from the heated water to build and eventually forces it to rupture. When heated, the natural moisture inside the kernel turns to steam. The inside starch becomes soft like gelatin, and when the skin bursts, the gelatinized starch spills out, cools, and literally turns inside out, forming the fluffy mushroom popcorn shape as we know it. Can okay. I try it? Yes. Well, of okay. course you can try Real it. Real quick. We're all vaccinated. <laughs> yeah. That's yummy. Yummy isn't the word. It's delicious. It's delicious. <laughs> I'm going to try to unload all the... <laughs> You were spotted in a crowd thanks to its circular shape. But the reason why you will forever remember this sausage is the taste. With a coarser, juicier texture than other sausages and a flavorful aroma from the generous amount of spices, Cumberland sausages are favorite in the UK. But there are only 12 butchers in the country making the original traditional sausage that's been granted a protected status. We're in Barrow and Furness, Cumbria, England. This county has been the home of Cumberland sausages for hundreds of years. And today we're going to learn more about the traditional method to make Cumberland sausages. A method that will take us back to the times of the British Empire. Let's go find out more. To make traditional Cumberland sausages, butchers would have originally used a local breed, the Cumberland pig, which is now extinct. 
So now they use rare breeds, outdoor pigs, like today's British Lop. And what you find is because they live longer, the flavour is in the meat, and with a little bit of spices and herbs, the sausage is fantastic. So, here we have the half of the pig. All right. This is the shoulder. This is the middle and the belly. So we have the loin, which is the loin chops and the belly pork. And then we have the leg. And we make a combination of the leg and the shoulder together. Because in the leg it's lean, and if you only just use the leg, you need a little bit of fat. So we need to combine the both. All right. And when we cut this, you will see that the, 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 the combination is the best. So the knife skills in taking off the meat from the bone, they've got to separate any sinew and skin. Okay. Believe it or not, any skin like this in a commercial machine yeah. can be made into a paste and could end up in a sausage. We don't want that and we haven't got the machine. So it's important that every little bit of sinew, bone, cartilage is removed so we end up with really nice meat. Yeah. And depending on profit, mm -hmm. we need as much meat from the bone as possible. Otherwise, it's a very bad butcher. Uh, it's okay. So this one has been skinned pretty well. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> Once the meat is the boned and de -grisled, these are the chops that will later be turned into Cumberland sausages. Rather than going through a more commercial bowl chopper and being emulsified, the meat is thickly minced to retain solid, chunky pieces. So those are nice, chunky pieces of mince that we, in a mouth texture would be really good. Yeah, that's true. I can see the fat, but it's not as dominant as you would think. We call that 80 VL. So 80 pieces are red, 20 pieces are white. It's called visual lean. We can see mm. this. Yeah, it's true, it's true. Because you never want to get rid of all the fat. No, 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 yeah. no, no. You still need a bit to flavour. But if you flavor. put too much yeah. fat in, then it comes, it fills up the pan and that's yeah. no good. And, and it your ruins, sausage shrinks. Yeah. But with this, the sausage will stay the same. It may sound obvious, but high meat content in a sausage is never a given. More commercial butchers will use bread or cereal, which is something Peter feels pretty strongly against. The bread or cereal will soak up some of that extra fat, which will in turn alter the structure and flavour of the sausage. We want a high meat content sausage. We want a proper Cumberland sausage to be yeah. recognised because it's different. And so we applied to the European Union for protection of our regional sausage. And that took... Ten years. Ten years, ten years, ten years. to be approved. <laughs> so, this is what they yeah. call bureaucracy, ten years. Now that we're all set on the importance of the meat, we are ready to learn more about another distinctive feature of our Cumberland sausage, its spices. These are added by hand before the whole mix is encased in the pig's natural intestine. So what sort of spices go into Cumberland sausages? What do we have here? There's in here we've yeah. got salt and pepper, we've got a little bit of sage and nutmeg that are finely ground, uh, we've got potato starch and rice flour. Okay. And this mixes the meat and the combination together. Then we've got some herbs, which right. is a little bit of sage, um, you could use a, a fresh sage, but with a dried sage, it gives it a little bit of better shelf life because it's nice and, and clean. Yeah. And then we've got the rusk, which is a, a pea starch. Which is not bread, right? Not bread, yeah. no. Now it's going a little bit dry, so we have to have a bit of water because all that has to come out of this nozzle. This specific spice blend wasn't random. According to Peter, back in the 1800s, German slate miners moved to Cumbria for work and brought their sausage recipe with them. But instead of the spices they were used to, they used spices they could get locally, which weren't actually that local. Spices were being imported to Cumbria from the Caribbean, thanks to the port of Whitehaven, the second biggest port in the country at the time. So there was always a little bit of spice. Sometimes you might even find ginger but predominantly nutmeg, mace, pepper. And these were the spices that made the Cumberland sausage 
very different. If you were working hard in the slate mines and you wanted to have a nice strong sausage, the local spices were fantastic. Wow. But really, the real component was the meat. Yeah, yeah. So now, all together makes something quite I unique. I take yeah. the, the intestine of the pig has been cleaned. Okay, so this is the intestine, yeah? Yeah, this is, this is the intestine. And Long. basically, we put this onto the nozzle of the sausage machine. All right. And this is very important that we use a natural casing, a natural intestine, mm -hmm. as opposed to the, the cowhide synthetic, which commercial sausage makers are now tending to use. So it just gives you a better, uh, a better texture at the end of the... Well, and, and exactly. The when taste, you cook yeah. it, that natural texture, it isn't chewy or rubbery or mm -hmm. plasticky like sometimes you find on some sausages. Yeah. So how, how long is that? This is <laughs> the intest one intestine from one pig, no? Because it, ca it has, it's continuous. In Victorian times, it was 19 yards. Now it's 21 meters. Okay, that, so now that, I know how long that is. <laughs> and that's, that's interesting because as we've improved the commercial viability of our pigs, the intestine has got longer and probably the ability to, to absorb more food. Mm -hmm. It's just one of them things. But yeah, there is yeah. definitely 21 yards, 21 meters. They have this uh, coil. Yeah, this thing coil. And why is that? Don't know. No. Probably because we couldn't tie knots. <laughs> really? <laughs> Maybe it came with the Germans because Maybe. they make. The rings of sausage. Okay. Yeah. So you know, maybe they were making a sausage with a ring. You know, like a ring, like the sausage. Sometimes in Germany, you have the yeah type of sausages. We don't know. And it's quite, it's quite pink. No. That's a nice traditional Cumberland sausage. Yeah. You can see the white bits. You can see the ATVL. You can see a little bit of the herbs. You can see where the fat is, which also makes you makes you realize that there's not that much of it. Sometimes I think you see sausages in Italy like this, don't you? Yeah, in my region we have one that's served like this. That's called zampina. Zampina. <laughs> yeah, it means it means little paw. All oh, right. But it's served in a coil oh, right. like this. Yeah and it's like the grilling sausage. Once in a coil, a proper Cumberland sausage needs to be left overnight to let the spices and herbs blend into the meat. Peter grilled some from yesterday's production for us to taste. Here, Claudia, have a taste of our sausage. Thank you. Here you go. Chef. <laughs> got, to, got to remember the camera, but then he gives you my best time. Yeah. <laughs> Here. <laughs> so the thickness is important. The coarse texture is important, but above all else, the taste in the mouth. Please. Yeah, cheers. Mmm. Mmm. That crack that you feel when you bite into the natural casing. Natural casing, yeah. natural intestine. Yeah. You're also mm. tasting meat. Definitely. That's prominent. A little bit of influence with the seasoning. Pepper. Pepper. A bit of pepper all. there, yeah. yeah. Obviously, a mm. bit of nutmeg. Can you taste it? Yeah, a bit of that as well. And to be cooking this mm -hmm. on the barbecue, on the grill, in the oven, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. It is, yeah, you can taste the meat. Like, it is It is quite meaty. Claudia, mm -hmm. if you own a Rolls Royce, uh, you wish. wouldn't put cheap oil <laughs> in the engine. Don't put bad food in your mouth. This is fantastic. Yeah. So, how would you recommend eating this? I mean, apart from this way, like on a stick. Traditionally, Oh, huh. In the ring. Ah, a wow. proper Cumberland sausage. A good Beautiful. meal. I mean, maybe a meal nowadays for two. Um, I'll eat that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we have a new project that we're really excited to show you. Here's the trailer. This is the largest free kitchen in the world. Open 24 hours year round 
This food hall feeds 100,000 people for free each day. Just one of these huge bowls is enough to feed around 10,000 people. We visited Amritsar in India to find out everything that goes into feeding such a large crowd and to see just what it takes to make such big batches. If you like the look of that, please subscribe to Food Insider and tune in tomorrow to watch the full episode. The more you give to Claudia, the less you have, you know. I, I know. Yeah. That's <laughs> it. It's the last one there. Have you had a bit? I'm also here. Sorry. <laughs>
So we're just taking the air bubbles out of the piece of taffy. Okay, that it looks kinda has to much be harder than you make it seem. This is actually pretty difficult because the, the tool itself is like sticking into the taffy. It's still chewy and sticky, you can tell, but it is a little harder than it was on that table. Four mechanical rollers called sizers size the candy down to get the rope of a candy to a certain diameter. The taffy tapers down through a second set of sizers until it resembles a snake. The machine at Trivers can cut, wrap, and seal about 300 to 400 pieces of taffy per minute. There's actually fingers that are closing the piece of taffy. Oh, right there, right there, right there. The inner layer surrounding the taffy must be wax paper to maintain its soft texture and deter the candy from sticking together. Do you mind if I untwist this? I no, but to... you have to do it the right way. How do you do it the right way? Okay, so the right way to open a piece of taffy is to pull both sides. There you go. And then we get, that's what we're looking for with the piece of taffy. Oh, amazing. So you may be wondering, why the heck is it called saltwater taffy if there's no salt? The story goes like this. There was a man named Mr. Bradley who sold taffy from a stand on a beach. One evening, the water came up and washed over his taffy. He thought his taffy was ruined, but a little girl approached him and asked if she could have a piece of his saltwater taffy. And since then, the name stuck. Shriver's saltwater taffy went from having 17 flavors to 60 flavors in the summertime, which is their busiest season. So every single day, you're gonna get a fresh piece of taffy. Every single day we are making fresh taffy. What are, what's your favorite? My personal favorite? Yeah. They're all my favorite. They're all? You don't have well, one? I have one that I'm not crazy about, but that's just because I'm not crazy about that flavor. Which one? I can't tell you. Is it grapes? Absolutely not. Everybody okay. loves grapes. Wait, I hate grapes, so I'm like... Oh, okay, so that's your one that yeah, you're taking the off the like, list. Yeah, that's the one like sour apple bubble gum. I don't know which one I want the most. That's the whole idea, right? Yeah, I feel like I want them all. All right, so I'm gonna take your recommendations. I've never had saltwater taffy. I've had like Laffy taffy. Cherry. Two of those. Pineapple. One of those. Tangerine. One of those. Yeah, I could take it, don't worry. <laughs> My little baby. My little... Taffy baby. <laughs> Banana taffy. I'm going crazy. In the family of smelly cheeses, there are probably only a few that will really make you go. <gasps> oh! <laughs> well, I have no doubt. For me, Stinking Bishop beats them all. Crowned the smelliest cheese in the UK, Stinking Bishop gets its distinctive smell thanks to Perry, which is a pear cider used to wash the rind of the cheese. The result? A moldy exterior, a squidgy texture, and an everlasting, pungent smell. We're in the pear orchards of Dimmock, Gloucestershire, England, at the home of Stinking Bishop. It is from the fruits of these trees that the infamous Perry cider is made. But while the Perry gives the cheese its distinctive smell, I'm curious. Will the cheese taste as strong as it smells? We're here to find out. There is only one farm in the world that makes this cheese, Charles Martel and Son. And just like Stinking Bishop is a semi-soft cheese, its recipe is semi-secret. We know it starts with pasteurized cow's milk that is left in a vat for four hours with ferments and rennet. We also know that the rennet used is a vegetable rennet. This helps coagulate the milk without interfering with the flavor of the cheese, which an animal rennet will do. The milk comes from the local Gloucester cattle. The milk from this breed is particularly suited for cheese making because during the coagulation process, its cream doesn't rise to the surface and get lost within the whey. Rather, it stays down in the milk and it will make the final cheese much richer. When the curd has reached the size of a nut, it is transferred into molds. This is the first secret step of the process. At the end of the molding, this tower of empty molds that you see behind me will be full of curd and after a certain amount of time that is also secret, the cheeses will be moved to the maturing room. Okay, this is the moment of truth, let's see. It's smelly. Oh, ooh. Mm. It <laughs> wow, well, it's not as bad as I thought. It doesn't smell bad, it just has a strong smell, I yes. think. Yeah, that's pungent. Lots of people describe as uh, old smelly socks. Okay. Which is a bit, oh, disgusting. <laughs> but actually, when you eat the cheese, it's really nice. 
Yeah. yeah. And you can't taste the smell, you can just taste the cheese, which is nice and smooth. It fills up your nostrils and just stays there. <laughs> With that smell still very much up in my nostrils, Justina took me through the most important step of the making of Stinking Bishop, washing it in Perry. This is done when the cheese is one day old. Old enough to hold its shape, but young enough to absorb the flavors of the Perry. How often do you do this? How often do you wash it in Perry? Only once. Only once. Only once. Oh, yes. and that's enough just to you enough. know <laughs> make everything that the cheese yes. is. All right. Well, it's uh, alcohol. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> also, you can you can smell the aroma of the perry, so you don't want uh, to have this too strong at the same time. Mm -hmm. And this washing is there a method to it, or is just you know <laughs> you caressing the cheese? Yes. And enjoying the work. <laughs> Uh, you putting, know, you're putting my love to it. work. Yes. yes. <laughs> the molds around the cheese are made of beech wood. You may ask, why? We don't know. That's another secret that the makers wouldn't share. My guess is that this helps the cheese keep its shape, of course, without being too rigid and thus allowing the cheese to retain some moisture. Like other semi-soft cheeses, and this we know for sure, Stinking Bishop wheels age for two to three weeks and they are turned regularly to ensure both sides mature equally. So this is the finished cheese that still smells even though it's... Yes, the <laughs> cheese packaged. always smells, yes. <laughs> so this is the ready cheese. Oh, wow. Oh, that's quite... Oh, it's beautiful actually, you know? Yes, it's, uh, yeah. It looks like one of those like eyeshadow palettes. Or something. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but he has, yeah, he has nice shades of um, yellow and red. Yellow, red, yeah. yes, a bit of orange. Yeah, it's kind pink. of sparkly, you know? Yes. <laughs> so all this is because of the washing in, in Perry plus your secrets, yep. you know? Yes, yes. <laughs> and I mean, is it a coincidence that the Perry itself, it's kind of reddish? Yeah, it's probably coming a bit from the Perry itself. So, what's the deal with this Perry? Well, around Gloucestershire, there are over a hundred varieties of Perry pears, which are smaller than your average pear. I know, these are blossoms, but pears were not in season when we visited. Anyway, turning them into Perry is quite a common thing here. The pear the Stinky Bishop baits in is called Stinky Bishop. Unlike what you might think, this pear doesn't stink. Most peri pears are little hard things like that. You know, if you threw somebody and hit them, it would hurt because they're so heavy and dense, little tiny things. But the stinking bishop pear is more pear-shaped and more juicy. It makes a, a good early peri because it's got high sugar. It ferments very quickly. And uh, so it's got a reputation of being a very strong pear. All right. And Named after Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop was rather an unsavoury character. And so he earned his name, the name stinking bishop. All right, so um, it has nothing to do with actual with bishops, bishops no. yeah. <laughs> but bishops love it. Lots of bishops give each other presents of stinking bishop <laughs> because they... It comes back, yeah. They think it's funny and it is, you know. Jokes, secrets and smell aside, the story of stinking bishop is not really about making a cheese that will make headlines. Rather, it is about making something that could save its very source. The milk from Gloucester cattle, which risks disappearing. Notice you've got a black head and black legs, but a body's brown. Okay. That's a mark of the breed, and they've got this white stripe and a white tail. Oh, okay. So all Gloucester cows have a, have a white tail? White tail, yeah. Oh. A little white stripe and a white, white belly. Well, uh, when I started here 50 years ago, there were 68 left in the world. In the world? And I thought, gosh, you know, they can't be let to become extinct. How can I help them? I managed to get hold of three, which I milked by hand, and... Um, I thought, I know, they're originally a cheese-making breed, we'll make cheese. It was my way of, of helping the breed survive. Not just by breeding them, but by using them. And that's the way they'll survive, if we use them. Oh, thank you. So do you eat the rind? Yes. Oh, yeah. That's where the most intense part of the flavour is. Oh, all right. So let's just have... Oh. A bit cold. I That's love right. it. 
It's really yeah. nice. Flavor's gone in, isn't it? Yeah. No smell at all. No? No. I mean... I'm not supposed to say no, that. No. <laughs> you know, like when you it's said you can't, you can't taste the smell, because uh, the smell can put you off. But this taste, I really love it. I don't know, it reminds mm. me of some cheese I used to eat when I was, when I was a child. Mm. It's just the texture in, my, in your mouth. A bit creamy, but not too, not too runny, so not too messy. <laughs> the flavour goes in from the rind, obviously, because on the rind is the culture, which is where you get the flavour. Yeah. The building where we're tasting the cheese is a distillery. And yes, you guessed it, this is where Perry is made. Charles tells me that his distillery is 400 years old. He even showed me some property documents from 1810. Built in 1650, so it's the oldest original distilling house still working at the British Isles. Oh, yes. is it? We know of no other older. The pear cider or perry that is used to wash the rind of the cheese is later turned into the sweet pear spirit called Poirot, which is made out of perry and fresh pear juice. Cheers. Can you say it in Italian? Cheers. Salute. Salute. Mm. Sweet. It's sweet, but not sugar sweet. That's no, uh, no, no. pear yeah. sweet. <laughs> I don't care. It's so peaceful here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Those are the peace. They're peaceful. <laughs> this machine is called a pickling injector, and it's directly injecting a saltwater brine into this cut of beef infusing it with flavor. It's one of the first steps that turns this into this, traditional pastrami that New Yorkers have been eating since the 1900s. We take a closer look at the meat itself and see how traditional pastrami is made. Pastrami is a classic New York deli meat that comes from the navel of a cow. These days, it's most common to use beef brisket. What makes it distinctive from other meats like corned beef is its brining process. And it all starts here at a warehouse in the Bronx. First, you have to start with the best cut of meat. This identifies that it's choice meat, which is a higher uh, cuts of meat. Choice beef is known for its tenderness, juiciness, and flavor, and is well suited for dry heat cooking. With uh, the demand, we've been able to produce almost every day of the week. New York City is home to a couple dozen Jewish delis, so it's no surprise that the warehouse goes through so much brisket. So this is part of the reason why our pastrami tastes the way it is, because it has a perfect blend of the, the fat and the lean meat content. We could go through all, between 10 and 15,000 pounds a week of, of, this, of the brisket. Did you say 10 to 15,000? 15, 15,000 pounds, yes. Oh, wow. Yes. The meat seen here is kosher, as many old school delis in New York City are Jewish. To be labeled kosher, animals have to be slaughtered in a certain way so that they cannot feel any pain, and the meat must be soaked and salted. For meat to remain kosher as it's shipped from a manufacturer to a facility like this, a mashrayak or supervisor must inspect the establishment to ensure it meets kosher standards. My job is to make sure that when these products come in, that they are kosher. You'll see this box that says Northland Kosher Beef. And in addition, right here in Hebrew, it says kosher meat. Kosher means fit for use. And the Bible tells us that uh, the Jewish people must keep kosher. And so what if, like, let's say you do find something? Then we gotta start from zero. The product is no good, gotta throw it away. The meat is actually labeled with a K. You see the kosher, mm -hmm. okay? The meat also has a plum book and lets you also know that, that it's kosher. The meat itself is washed every three days. When all is inspected, the meat can move on to the pickling or the brining process. Gone are the days of the industry where meats like pastrami are brined for two to four weeks. Now, machinery like this speeds up the process by injecting the brine solution directly into the meat. This allows the meat to retain the same amount of flavor it would get from brining the old-fashioned way, all in just 24 hours. So I honestly came in here assuming that we would have the meats in the brining solution and you'd have like a ton of refrigerators of like just them soaking up. Right. But this is the this is fastest the, way. This is the fastest way, yes. Oh wow. Yes. And is this a standard across the board? For the volume that we're doing, we wouldn't have the time to wait the two to three weeks. We need to get it in and get it out. 
The cuts of beef are pickled one at a time and injected to ensure the juices and flavors penetrate the meat thoroughly. The brine and the solution that we use is, is uh, proprietary just for us. We created it. It took many years to get it right, but after years and years in the making, we, we got it down. This is the solution we use. No one else has anything like it. There's some salt, there's some pepper, there's garlic, there's herbs, there's spices, but it would all be in a powder and a liquid form that we turn into it. It's just the, the perfect flavor. So when you eat our pastrami, it's like, wow. So now that the meat is brined, yes. what is the next what, step? What we're gonna do is obviously, we're gonna seal each individual piece, cryovac sealed, and then that's it within, by the next day, tomorrow, could be sold to the stores for consumption. Mark's team aims to brine and vacuum seal 5,000 pounds of pastrami at a time. And after 24 hours, the pastrami's headed to delis like Pastrami Queen. This is a brisket, this is the stomach part of a cow. It's the most fatty and meatiest part of a cow. If you didn't have the fat, or as much fat as you need, it would dry out. As it cooks slowly, the fat burns away and melts away slowly into the meat, bringing the flavor further into the meat, and therefore keeping it tender and, and juicy. What happened if you kept more of the fat on the meat? You would damage the tenderness and the, and the quality of the meat. The balance is very important. What do we want to taste with the final product? It has to be juicy, it has to be savory. You have to taste the fat, the meat, all the flavor that goes into it. To get the pastrami ready for the smoker, cooks add a dried rub. It's been 14 days. You remove the meat from the brining process. You add the salt, the pepper, the brown sugar to balance out the salty sweet flavor, and then caramel. We actually add caramel so you could be able to rub it and it's evenly around the meat, which causes a perfect browning of the meat while it's being cooked. And make sure the whole meat is covered. So you brine it in these ingredients, then you're also rubbing it. Yes, you keep the flavor so as the meat breaks down and the fat breaks down, the flavor continuously is being reinfused into the meat, which makes the perfect pastrami. And that's why you do twice, yes, like a brine twice. and a dry rub. Yes, two times is always better than once. The meat is then placed into a smoker for two to four hours at 225 degrees Fahrenheit. Next comes the steam. The piece of pastrami lies in a steamer for four to six hours. Okay. This is what a final pastrami brisket would look like at Pastrami Queen. Yes, sure, you see all the seasoning and everything is still together. It has a good consistency. When you slice it, it stays together. So when you get a bite, it's a fulfilling, savory, salty, sweet, caramelized flavoring. That looks salivating, holy moly. It's hard not to take a bite of this meat right now. I know. This is our version. I think it works best. Proof is in the pudding. My customers have been customers for decades and decades. Depending on where you are in the world, you will find a different version of bacon. In the US, you will have a savory piece of pork belly that's been cured and smoked. As an Italian, my go-to bacon is pancetta, dry cured dices of pork belly. Here in England, your bacon will be a leaner but still juicy cut of meat from the back of the pig, cured to perfection. Today, we're in South Cerny, in Gloucestershire, and we're at the Butts Farm, a farm that specializes in rare breeds. What we're going to see today is bacon made from Gloucestershire Old Spots. They're one of the oldest breeds here in the UK, and they're renowned for having a tender marble meat. So, what better way to taste it than in the form of bacon? Thank you. Hello, friend. Compared to more commercial pigs that feed on high protein and cereal, an old spot follows a low protein diet, complemented with grass, worms, and whatever they can munch away at here at the farm. The Gloucester old spots also have a lot of fat on them naturally. That's good. You don't have to eat the fat, but when you cook it, you've got the fat running through the meat, which gives you the flavor. All right. This is what we're going to be working with. Yep. This section is cut from the top of the leg to the fourth rib and, on the other side, the first flat bone across the thigh and the leg. Carl pierces the skin a few times to allow the salt to get right into the center of the bacon. He tells me that the best bacon is one that is cured within the first week after slaughtering the pig. This is to avoid tough skin, 
which the curing will make even tougher and will take all the moisture out of the meat. Drawing most of the moisture out is, however, our way to go with our dry cure today. Carl uses fine sea salt, which he prefers as it gets right into the meat much quicker than coarse salt. So you want to get all the cure mix into the centre, and when they're not having the nitrates in, it does take that little bit longer to cure. You want the salt to have contact first, because that will just give you the right, the right way to cure. Oh, wow, that's quite a lot of salt. It is, so... <laughs> so how many cures is that? That's five. For, for this much, you'd probably only need two, two and a half kilos of salt but it cures better if you just get that caked in salt. All right. And it doesn't really absorb more of it. It just seals. Just get nice and covered. So that provides the base of the cure. So that will instantly start drawing out the moisture, changing that product from pork into the, the bacon product. Carl leaves a little bit of salt for later in the curing process. After a few days, the meat will be repacked with salt to drain the excess moisture that has come out. The next ingredient to be added is unrefined brown sugar. Just like salt, sugar will draw out moisture, but it will also add a light sweetness to the meat and get rid of the sharpness of the salt. Just like salt, a bit of sugar is saved for later. The cure continues with pink and black peppercorns, bay leaves and juniper berries. The berries will bring lightness and sweetness with the sugar to the edge of the bacon. And lots of colour, which is good. It'd be nice to have a big pestle of mortar and look. Yeah, so you're just going to crush them. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to gently just, just to get some of the powder out of the peppercorns. Oh. And the juniper berries are still, they're still slightly wet because they're a, a berry. As we break them, there's just a little moisture still. It's a little bit like doing, making your gin and having the botanicals. <laughs> it is like that. You can pick, you can yeah. pick savory and, and and strong flavors in your botanicals. I've seen people do rosemary bacon and things like that. Oh. Mm. Just trying to infuse different flavors in. Yeah, you can you can just personalize it. Just I think bit. so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah, I wouldn't want to see people experiment too too, too, too much. Well, but, yeah. it's up to them, I guess. If, but yeah, bay leaves act almost like it's that stability for the flavour. Oh. So you just give them a little bit of a crush because wow. they're fresh. They're, yeah, they're very, they're they're very like, nice green. Not like the dry ones. <laughs> just give those a little rip. Nice Ooh. having them grown on a nice smell. In, yeah. In the garden by one of our uh, ladies in the office. Oh. I asked her for some bay leaves. She bought me half of her tree. So this is <laughs> very good. That looks fantastic already. Go. After 14 days and after removing the bones, this is the end result of our curing process. So we've got the back bacon and this is where it went from the shoulder. That's where we came in from the leg. So we generally take the back bacon off with a little tail. So a small amount of the streaky remains on the back bacon. Yeah. Just because that's the, that's the shape we normally use. Yeah. Plus it gives that little bit of fat to cook with. Yeah, for sure. So you just separate that. down like that and that will give you your streaky and your back bacon. Oh! Butchers refer to dry cured unsmoked bacon like this here as green bacon or green back. This is nothing scary and is completely natural, it's just the salt slightly over curing the edges of the bacon. A little trim and our Gloucestershire Old Spots bacon is ready to be revealed. If we then look at the centre of the bacon, that's when you've got that Oh, nice! beautiful cure, nice flavour going through. There's a bit of marbling as well. Yeah, so the way you've got the really nice native breeds and the finish is really good on Judy's pigs, it just starts to build up just a little bit of fat in the muscle, mm -hmm. which then cook for cooking makes it amazing, wow. just like it would yeah. a ribeye steak. The fat will always disintegrate first because it reacts to heat and, and reduces, so mm -hmm. it just breaks the meat into parts. So your bacon is then quite tender, which is quite a nice way to yeah. do things. And so that's that's the speciality of like gross, gross yeah. Part. Yeah, 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 definitely. You can find definitely. out. Yeah, yeah, well, you get your pork chops, and there's not just fat on the outside. You've got actually a nice bit of taste and flavour going through it, which is really good. Wow. Okay. So yeah, so that's a traditionally dry cured, nitrate-free bacon.
my first question is, why did you put this in the oven rather well, than frying it? Well, because it's got so much of its own lovely fat, and we love fat around here. We love food around here, but we love fat as well. Especially. Uh, especially. <laughs> um, you don't need to fry it in oil or butter, and you wouldn't even need to turn it over, which is why it really suits cooking in the oven. Especially me as a farmer, you know, the animals can get up to it and, and you know, I bung it in the oven and, and I got sort of 20, 30 minutes to go and sort out any crisis that might be on the farm. And, um, and there you go, it's ready without having to do anything. Okay, and this is the most like traditional way around here to... It, it is the it. most traditional yeah. way. The, the tradition is that you um, cook your bacon, you fry your eggs in the fat, and then you do your fried bread in the fat from the bacon. All right, so, so the bacon is, it, the it, it's, it's the base for everything. It's the base for everything, exactly, and that okay. is your traditional breakfast. All right, let's have a taste then. Oh, let's have a go, let's shall have. we? How lovely. Just like that. So why is it that back bacon is more popular in here? Right. I think so. really, probably because you've got more meat to fat ratio. Yeah. You know, you've got all that, that lovely eye muscle it's called there. Um, the eye muscle you can relate to a pork wow. job on maybe loin. And mm. um, and then and then the, the nice bit of crispy fat. But the That's great. If you don't love fat quite as much as I do, um, uh, then maybe yeah. you have got a bit more meat there. Yeah, but oh. I like I like the taste of the meat as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And this is a great compromise yeah, yeah. between the two. Yeah. I love um, it, yeah. Yeah. It's I mean of, it tastes yeah. of pork, doesn't it? It shouts pork. Yeah. You know, you know what you're eating. Yeah. And and you'll notice also that we're eating the rind. It, it's edible. Um, and that that is because it's what's called supple first and it's really just cured in a traditional way, yeah. and you can eat all of it. Yeah, the rind it, is not chewy. No, no, not at all. I just, I really like the fat that um, you can taste the fat, but there's also a bit of that, as Carl was saying, a little bit of that um, juniper berries. Oh, and, um, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, they got, add something to, you know, to the, the taste. The, yeah. The, the one flavor complements the other. You're not getting a dominant flavor there really mm. at all, are you? That's lovely. lovely. Yeah. yeah. No, it's really good, isn't it? Really good. Yum. Josephine, it's over here, darling. And this here is Dolly Pig, Princess Joan. Oh, she's That's a princess. That's her title. Give boy Gerald, come on. Come on, Piggy Weeks. He is such a poser. Oh, that's it. Ecstasy. <laughs> this is a pig in ecstasy. <laughs> it's so sweet. Just love him. This is a black and white cookie, topped with dark chocolate icing on one half and vanilla on the other. It's a classic dessert that is only made right here on the East Coast. If you grew up in New York, chances are you've seen black and white cookies at shops dotted across the state. Today, we visit Zara's Bakery, a company that ships its cookies nationwide to get a behind the scenes look at the making process. Bakeries like Zaro's can sell 100,000 cookies each year. While recipes may vary from shop to shop, the cookies are always slathered with rich chocolate icing on one side and vanilla on the other. Here in New York City, you're likely to find a flatter, denser, vanilla cake-like cookie with a smooth, shiny fondant icing. Meanwhile, in upstate New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, don't even think about calling them black and whites. The cookies here are the Half Moon variety. And although these cookies have made quite the footprint, it's the New York City style that's made its claim to fame. Grabbed a couple of black and white. And a black and white cookie for me. The recipe is simple. It starts off with ingredients like oil, eggs, and lots of sour cream. We use sour cream, it's, it helps to tenderize the cookie and keep it moist and soft, and it also gives it a little bit of, of sour flavor. Is the purpose of the sour cream also to make it that sponge-like texture? Yes, it will. It helps, it, it certainly helps with the texture. Doing great. Good. Okay, we did it. It's messy and fun. <laughs> Next comes the whole milk. We're adding milk again, more fat, keeping it creamy, keeping the cookie soft, and helping to maintain that cakey texture. The dry ingredients consist of baking soda, baking powder, salt, and natural vanilla flavor. But the key to black and whites is to add enough flour so the batter holds shape. What ingredients in this make it more like a cake consistency versus a cookie consistency? Well, we use a combination of AP flour and cake flour. 
Up next, gonna be 40 pounds of sugar. The sour cream is a big one. We do use honey, but those are the ingredients that we use to really keep it moist and fluffy like cake. Why honey? It's something, we've, we've used honey for a long time. Um, honey does help cake and cookies to retain moisture mm -hmm. better than just regular sugar rolls. It smells really good. This mixer is, it's gotta be 50 years old, at least. And it's one of these machines that, you know, they don't make them like this anymore. For some reason, when we've tried to mix our black and whites and some of the other mixers, we've not gotten the result we like. And so, what's that result? A soft, airy, well-mixed, beautiful cookie. As soon as the flour mixture is complete and has zero clumps, bakers move on to the making of the fondant. It's icing sugar and water for the most part. And then the chocolate is icing sugar, water, and cocoa powder for color and chocolate flavor. There are some slightly different ingredients within the icing sugar that help it to set up. We've used the fondant as long as I've been alive. Our great-grandfather decided that was how he was making them. I do think it was more of a New York City, East Coast way to make the cookie. Maybe New Yorkers don't have time to carry around a, a black and white cookie with, um, buttercream. with buttercream on top. It would make too big of a mess. It could be. All right, do you need help? I would love some help. Ugh. Yeah. It's about 50 pounds. It's a little smoky. So we are going to mix the icing sugar for about four minutes at a very low speed to beat out any lumps and make sure it's nice and smooth and ready to take liquid. I am setting up another timer now for four minutes. Okay. And on that four minutes, we are going to pour the water through the grate into here as it mixes slowly on first speed. It's getting there. You can see in the center, yeah. see how it's starting to get shiny? Yeah. That's what we're looking for throughout. And so if it was a chocolate fondant, you yes. would put cocoa powder as the last step? Correct. You get a different flavor, yeah. but they're the same base. What do you prefer? Chocolate. Yeah, me too. Way. Me too. I'm a chocolate lover. It, it kind of has a sticky texture to it. It does. It yeah. will be very sticky. It will have a stringiness to it. We're looking to get a, a very nice coating where it's, you're not seeing the bottom of the cookie. And how long did this process take your great-grandfather to develop? And when he came from Poland, he came from Poland as a trained baker. So somebody in Poland trained him and taught him how to bake. Once the icing is at its optimal thickness, bakers store the icing at ambient temperature in small buckets. It's naturally cool at this point. Um, we keep it at room temperature. The ambient around here stays at about 68 degrees. We make about uh, 400 pounds. Well, sadly, during, during the, the times of the pandemic, we're making about 100 pounds a week. Before the pandemic, we were probably making 500 pounds of icing a week. This is fun. It's so you can see the consistency, right? Yeah, it's very nice. It looks like frosting, but you can tell that if it stayed on a cookie, it has more of a sticky consistency. The longer we wait to do this, the harder it will get to get out of this bucket. How long can the fondant last? It can last a couple of weeks. It's, it's basically just sugar and water, so it can sit out. Oh my god! It's... <laughs> All these things are much harder than they look. Yes, it's I very swear. true. I'm sure at every place you go, they usually are. Yeah, it looks heavenly to eat. And it does have a thicker consistency than frosting, and it's definitely stickier. This just came out of the mixing bowl. And as you saw when we were pulling it out, it was still pretty viscous and liquid. It had flow to it. You could see the flow is now stopping and yeah. it's starting to solidify. Oh yeah. And this will get, it will never get hard, uh -huh. but it will get to a point where it's set up and dry and you could, you could touch it and it won't, it won't leave fingerprints, it won't leave marks. Um, and then underneath you'll have a little bit of kind of tender, more tender icing underneath. And so that's why it has, it's time sensitive to get it out of the bowl, because if we left it in the bowl, from the top down, it will continue, wherever, wherever is in the air, it will continue to harden. Okay, so we are making the chocolate icing and I can already smell the cocoa. Can you talk about the chocolate fondant? Anything special? Oh my God. My desire to, to bathe in it, is that <laughs> acceptable to say on television yes. or no? What we're doing right now is warming the fondant so that we can, we can manageably spread it. Because the longer you wait, that same setup process will happen again. So it will cool down, it will get harder, and then you'll get inconsistent spread on each cookie. You know, full transparency, I'm not good at this. That's okay. Um, but, but what the basics of it are is we're gonna scoop up some fondant. Yeah. You're gonna wipe it across this way. Uh -huh. You're then gonna come back this way toward you to get a nice clean line. You wanna get a good line right down the center. And then you go back one more time and you clean the edge. It's really important, we put the white fondant on first. Why? And we let the white fondant go on, it sets up. Mm -hmm. And the reason we do it is so that you get a really nice clean line. If you try and put them on at the same time, this line tends to bleed. And I only get a little bit, right? That's, that's perfect. Okay, so you can go, that's fine, go toward you. Okay, now, now keep it the same way and then oh. go away from you again. 
Like this? And you want to spread out like here if you can. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, go back one more toward you and spread a little further that way. Not bad. Spread there a little. It's too That's thick. That's not bad. <laughs> no, it's per hey, for your first time, it's pretty good. I'm very impressed. Thank you so much. Very impressed. There you go. Why is it important to frost the bottom of the cookie? The cookies bake this way. Yeah. So they get deposited. And almost like a cake, you get this little kind of crown on top of them. That's how they bake. You just don't get that really pretty edge and that beautiful separation between the two. It's much harder on the round side of the cookie. We believe in the tradition of this and we like doing them by hand. The vanilla fondant has hardened and now we're adding the chocolate and it's a little bit more of a test because we got to get that perfect line. I think that line is solid. Yeah, but see, I put too, it's a little too much on, but that's okay. <laughs> it's going to taste really good. All right, so go for it. Do you want me to do this one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. If you were to bake all this again, what part of the process would you enjoy the most? I would go with the eating part. I never heard of black and white cookies prior to coming to New York. Where did you grow up? I live in Midwest, okay. like Chicago. That makes sense. But I read online somewhere that the Midwesterners call them Harlequins. Really? Yeah. And then do you know of the German version of this, the Americaners? Yes, I have read about them and it's very similar. Yeah, it was brought over there with the soldiers during World War II and they brought over this cookie and so the German soldiers were like, oh, it's the Americaner cookie. Our family lore is that our, our great grandfather had a customer who'd come in with two small children who couldn't afford to buy two cookies. One liked vanilla, one liked chocolate. My great grandfather started doing icing one half vanilla yeah. and one half chocolate. Your brother actually was telling us everyone has a different story on how they eat the cookie. Yes. I generally take mine, and if I'm gonna eat the whole cookie, I'll kind of work from here, okay. as I prefer the chocolate. If I'm sharing the cookie, I usually break off the vanilla and give it to somebody else, <laughs> and I eat the chocolate. Like, my wife loves the vanilla, and I like the chocolate, and so oh, we're, a good, we're a good black and white pairing. Down up, we'll get as much as we can in here. Oh my god! It's... <laughs> try, and get, try and get low on it. All these things are much harder than they look. Yes, it's I very swear. true. I'm sure at every place you go, they usually are. Yeah. 